The weight to volume method. There's really two things that you need to know for, for the math, and it's multiplying by two and multiplying by four. So if you can do that, we're good. <laughs> um, so the first thing you need is your, the plant you're going to work with. Um, the same thing, you need a clean mason jar with a tight fitting lid, your solvent of choice. Um, in a kitchen scale, that's gonna be a little different than the folkloric method. Um, and measuring cups or glass beakers and the strainer and the funnel we'll use when I show you how to filter out some of the herbs. So here is a simple scale. You can get, they're really pretty inexpensive. We're talking like nine or $10. And I like to keep one of these handy. Um, these weigh about an ounce. And so um, you can kind of, on this scale, you can tear it out, but some, not all scales you can do that. Um, but they're really handy for doing this. So I just wanted to show you how to do the weight to volume, because a lot of people get discouraged, but I promise you it's very simple. Echinacea. This is um, from a local, uh, but biodynamically grown echinacea. And this is mostly flowers and stems and leaves um, that I have here. So because I'm using dried, I'm gonna weigh, weigh this out and then multiply by four. So one to two, this is for fresh. And then one to four, dry. So weight to volume, I'm gonna weigh out two ounces. So I'm converting from the standard to the metric system here. And a lot of people get confused. But this right here is the, um, these little beakers are really great for measuring uh, the liquid. There is a store in Asheville that you can pick these up at called Villagers, where you can get these. And then if you can't, you can order them from like a science um, place. But when we're measuring a lot of the volume, we are gonna use this. We're gonna use this. So I'm going to take the two ounces and change it to milliliters. So we're looking at 60. One ounce has roughly 30 milliliters in it. So we have two ounces. So that's gonna give us 60 milliliters. So we have roughly 60 grams here, okay? So we want 240, this is what we want. So I fill this to the 200, and then I have this handy little one that um, has, you know, much smaller amounts, so I'm gonna fill that up to 40. Take my clean jar. Do you do anything to clean your jars other than run them through a dishwasher? I rinse them out really well. I mean, um, yes, you can you can boil them, um, but a lot of uh, I mean everything will nothing can survive. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Here we go. And it covers it perfectly. And if I have stuff poking up, I can take uh, my pestle here and push it down. And we're gonna wanna do the same thing. We're going to want to um, shake it as well every day. So you might have to just push it down every day after you shake it. Um, do you keep that in the darker light? Yep, you want to keep it in a dark closet, keep it out of direct sunlight. 
So one thing that we want to do um, and get in good habit with is labeling. Um, I'm going to show you how to label, and if there's any questions, then I'll take them. The benefits of doing the weight to volume ratio or weight to volume tincturing is that we can duplicate what we're doing. Uh, we have a way to keep track of our process, and we, um, it's a really good idea to have a little, you know, little gardening book, a little your medicine making book, and you're writing down the dates of everything. Um, so that when you go back, you know, you know what you did, and you can replicate it. So when you label, I always put the, uh, the scientific name, and I put the date, and I put, you know, where I harvested it from. Yes. You put the date that you prepare it initially, or the date that it's finished? You put the date. That's the most important, I think. That's, yeah, when you begin. And I, I always put that date, the date that you begin, on the final tincture label as well, because that's like the, the genesis, of when it, genesis of when it all happened. And this is a one to four is what I write, and I do dried. So I'm gonna write this on the board because you can't see what I'm doing. Um, so you put the, I like to put the scientific because it really helps me to learn it when I do that. It's just getting into some good habit life. So labeling is part of your good habit life with medicine making. Um, it will help you learn these, these names. Um, and then I put the common name. You can put either in either order. And then I put the ratio. So, and this is one to four. Dried is how you do that. I put the date. And I put where I got it. Um, Why is that important to you? What? Where you got it? Uh, I think it's really, in, well, for a couple reasons. If, you're, if you are starting an apothecary, let's say for a business, you want to keep track of where it came from for if something was to happen and you needed to kind of track your steps. Uh, if you're not growing your own plant, but you're purchasing it, there's usually a lot number that's on there um, on the label when you purchase it. And so you would just write that lot number. Um, and that will identify, you could call up the grower and they would know the date and the time and the place that they were growing it. That's where it's, it keeps track of that. So I'll put that on here. Are there any other questions about the, yeah? I noticed that plants, the same plant will be different in different soils and in different zones. I've gardened in zone two, and now then five, and now six A. Mm -hmm. And each of that same plant is different depending on those various locations. So with that in mind, mm -hmm. how do you feel the extract of those plants matter, or do they change? As do the, you know, the plants, the identical plant in different ecosystems. What impact does that have on extracting the goodness from? That's a great question. Yeah, there's uh, there's a lot. I mean, you could trace, you could trace it by taking samples and sending it to a lab if you wanted to. I mean, that would be one way. Um, and when you're growing plants from year to year, you're going to notice that. I know um, I've seen this time and time again where I'll put a plant in and it will slowly migrate to another place in the garden. It's showing me where it likes to grow. Um, it wants, doesn't want as rich soil or it wants better drainage. Or So you're always trying to navigate that, uh, trying to find out what it, what it likes and how you're Gardening does affect the chemical composition of how, how the plant you know, is in the soil and what minerals it's bringing into itself. Um, and there's a lot of 
thought that with some of the uh, less um, fussed over medicinal plants, they actually produce a higher um, healing medicinal benefits. Um, so I've heard all various things. Some plants do want more attention and some just want to be left alone. Um, so when, when we have a plant, we all know that the plant puts in roots. Um, and typically the time that there's a lot of that subterranean growth is um, when after the first frost. And so the energy from the plant will really recede back into the earth and start taking in, um, that's when a lot of the underground growth happens, when the top part dies away. And so um, for doing a root harvest, you can do it in the fall or the spring, early spring before, you know, just after the last frost, or right, right around there. Um, and then as the plant is moving up in the springtime, um, for instance, right now the nettles is popping up and it's perfect time to harvest nettles. Um, perfect time to harvest chickweed. Because um, that energy, that vitality from the plant is just like, it's just like emerging and it's at its most potent state. Um, in the midsummer, in the heat, um, you know, there's a lot of exhaustion that happens with the plant, but I tend to not harvest. So uh, the leaves um, I'll do in the spring to early summer, and then I just sort of give it a break. Um, and then the roots I'll do in the fall and spring. And you start getting into a really beautiful cycle with your plants about when to harvest them, and you really get to know them, and it becomes the rhythm of your life. So. Another reason for doing the weight to volume method is knowing also the relative strength. And this goes for like dosaging and different things. And there's a really great book I highly recommend everyone to have um, by Stephen Buhner, where he gives a lot of the ratios from his own experience of, I don't know, it's about 40 years, and other of his other herbalists. And he's put together this really great, in the back of the book, his recommendations for per alcohol percentage and his dosaging recommendations for so many herbs. So that's an incredible resource. What's, What's his last name? Stephen Buhner. Yeah. Um, I can grab the book. I'll show you. We can pass it around. He's written a lot of books, herbal antibiotics and herbal antivirals. I recommend both of them highly. So the ones you're recommending, what you were telling us about? Mm -hmm. okay. So I could pass them over, or you can take a photograph of them later. So, But it's Stephen Buhner, Stephen B-U-H-N-E-R. Know your low-dose plants. So another good with the weight to volume is that you're going to have, because you know that you've been measuring it, you're not going to be ingesting very much, say, poke root. Like there's, there's certain plants, and I recommend taking time to really study those over the course of, uh, of your life, but uh, not to, um, you, can, you can modify that. Um, I certainly have made uh, low dose plants with the folkloric method and really keep it in mind, I'm taking one or two drops. Um, so that's an added benefit. So we went over this, we went over that. Do you have a proof of moonshine? It varies. You can buy moonshine at ABC store and it's 100 proof, but it can go you know, all the way up really pretty high. It all depends who's making it, I suppose. Um, I don't know if it's still available, but I know that when we first moved here about, you know, I guess it was well out, probably about five years ago, we went across the border to South Carolina, and you could buy the 190 proof, left them all there, mm -hmm. bought a case of it. <laughs> so that's another location where you can find it. Yeah. Different states. Yeah. I want a quick story about when we were first transferred here. A neighbor came over, he was walking kind of funny, 
and he had his hands down like this. So he says, come on, let's go out back where he knew I had a bench underneath a great tree. So he handed me this Dixie cup, and then I figured, I think I know what's coming. And so I, would, I took a tiny, tiny taste of it. Oh, that's very nice. And I set it down on the stump, and then he would take a taste. I was pretending to, and about the fourth time when I picked up that Dixie cup, there wasn't any bottom. <laughs> His wound shine had oh, beat oh, out the, the Dixie oh, cup. Oh, oh, oh. And he was just, oh. so, thank you, Jake, thank you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's pretty extreme. <laughs> it's a good story. Uh -huh.